This is a video about the squeeze theorem for Riemann integrable functions. So before you watch this video, you should have watched the video about the Cauchy criterion, which is a characterization of what it means for a function to be Riemann integrable. And um, maybe if you remember, the definition of the Riemann integral of a function, it's useful when maybe you've got a hint at what the actual value of the integral is. Whereas with the Cauchy criterion, um, it just compares the Riemann sums to each other. So you don't necessarily need to know what you think the value of the integral is. So that's why you might use try the Cauchy criterion when you don't have a good candidate for what the actual value of the integral is. And uh, so what we're gonna prove in this video is the squeeze theorem. And so we're gonna use the Cauchy criterion to do it. So what's the squeeze theorem for Riemann integrable functions? So you've got a function f from a, b, the closed interval a to b to r, and so f is Riemann integral on a, b, if and only if the following happens. So again, I'll have another characterization of what it means for f to be a Riemann integrable function. So if and only if this happens, for every epsilon bigger than zero, you should be able to find two functions. We'll denote them by, say, alpha sub epsilon and omega sub epsilon. And just the subscript, again, says that it might depend, or that it should depend on what epsilon is. So for each epsilon, you should always be able to find two functions that are Riemann integrable with the following properties, that they, prov they provide lower and upper bounds for f, so alpha is always smaller than f, and omega is always bigger than f for every x in the interval that you're you know, gonna integrate on. And also though, the difference between omega and alpha, when you take the integral of that, it should be less than epsilon, and that's kind of the, the squeezing business. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna prove this if and only if, so uh, what do we need? Remember, it's a biconditional, so let's do the forward direction. Let's suppose that f is Riemann integrable. Well, if f's already in here, why don't I just take alpha and omega to just be f? Then these are all equalities. And then when I do this, I get zero. And the integral is zero, zero. So for any epsilon, it's less than epsilon. That's the idea. So that's the forward direction, pretty quick. The other direction, going backwards, when we get to assume all of this good stuff and try to conclude that f is Riemann integrable, it's a little bit harder. But maybe, as far as the setup here, you know, I don't necessarily know what a good candidate for the um, value of the integral might be, and maybe it might be hard trying to do this with the straight up definition. So what we're gonna try to do is to use the Cauchy criterion to help us out here. And so what we'll do then so we're gonna let epsilon be bigger than zero, we'll fix that, and let's, let, let's say we've got our functions, alpha epsilon and omega epsilon, that are Riemann integrable, and I say here, satisfy the state hypotheses. I mean, all this good stuff. Alpha is smaller than f, omega is bigger than f for every x, and also the difference between, the integral of the difference is less than epsilon. So that's what I mean by satisfy the stated hypotheses. All right, well, because alpha and omega are Riemann integrable, I know what I should be able to say about uh, the actual integral of alpha and how it relates to Riemann sums uh, for sufficiently small partitions. And similarly, I should be able to make some kind of a statement using the definition about the actual value of the integral of omega epsilon uh, with respect to um, the Riemann sums over a particular partition with a small enough norm. And so what we can say then, again, just by definition then, I've already got an epsilon, so we should be able to find some delta that corresponds to the epsilon up here that I've started with. And now what we'll do is we'll apply really the definition of what it means for, again, alpha and omega to be Riemann integrable functions. So if I take any tagged partition P dot whose norm is less than this delta here, then we should be able to say the following thing, that the Riemann sum of alpha on that partition P dot is within epsilon, of the actual value of the integral of alpha. And then similarly, the Riemann sum of omega on p dot is within epsilon of the actual value of the integral of omega. Now what we're gonna do is, just like in college algebra, I'm gonna rewrite this as like a compound inequality. So that says that minus epsilon is bigger, is less than what's inside, which is truly less than epsilon. And what we'll do is we'll keep simplifying this a little bit. What I'm gonna play with is I'm gonna get a lower bound for this Riemann sum of alpha on p dot. And so a good lower bound, all I did is I subtract, I, sorry, I added this integral over to the other side here. So I hope that you see that's what this is. So this would be a good lower bound for the Riemann sum of alpha on p dot. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at this one and play the same kind of game. So maybe rewrite that absolute value inequality as this kind of compound inequality. And now what we'll try to do is get an upper bound 
on the Riemann sum of omega on p dot. And how would I do that? Well, I'd probably just add this integral over to that side with epsilon. And that's the next line. And so I'm gonna use these inequalities. That's why I've denoted them with like a star and a double star, just to keep track of them because they're gonna be useful in a moment. So I've got a lower bound for the Riemann sum of alpha and I've got an upper bound for the Riemann sum of omega on just any tag partition that's got a small enough norm in order to satisfy this definition of the Riemann integral. Okay. So what we're going to do now is we're going to use the fact that, well, if alpha is less than or equal to f, which is less than or equal to omega, then certainly like Riemann sums should, uh, should obey the same inequalities. And so in that case, what we have then is, well, the Riemann sum of alpha over this partition p dot should be less than or equal to the Riemann sum of f over this partition p dot, which is less than or equal to the Riemann sum of omega over this partition p dot. And so that is the way that we're going to bring f into the story. Remember, f is the one that is the one that we want to show as Riemann integrable here. So what we'll do then, if I think about this string of inequalities combined with star and double star, now I've got um, some upper and lower bounds for the Riemann sum of, uh, of f on p dot. So that tells me the, that this should also serve as a lower bound for the Riemann sum of f on p dot. And then similarly, double star here, well, since uh, f is less than this Riemann sum, then this guy should serve as a good upper bound for the Riemann sum of f as well. So that's how we're putting all three of these together. So I've got good bounds for the Riemann sums of f on p dot. Now what we're gonna do is, let's say I took any other partition q dot, I would get the exact same inequalities, right? Anything I've done so far, all it depended on was I took this delta small enough. So anytime, right, for, for any partition that has a norm less than delta epsilon, we should be able to say this kind of thing. I don't care if this thing's name is p dot or q dot. So let's say I take another partition, q dot, that also has a norm less than delta epsilon. I should be able to say the exact same inequalities here, just with the different uh, partition here. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna subtract. So the way that I'm gonna think about this is I'm gonna take this one here and I'm gonna subtract S, the Riemann sum of F on Q dot from each of the terms above in that inequality. And so what you see I'm angling for, so I hope that you see that I subtracted this just everywhere in the above inequality. And kind of now you see maybe what I'm angling for here. I've got a statement about the difference between two Riemann sums of my function. And so what I want to show eventually is that this is arbitrarily small because then that would satisfy the Cauchy criteria. That's the angle, that's the direction that we're trying to go. All right, so now we want to think about, well, what can we say about this string of inequalities here? And maybe what I'll do is I'll focus on this side. So here I'm taking away the Riemann sum of f on q, but what do I know? Well, if I was to uh, replace it by this, then I'm taking away more so that this inequality should still be satisfied. If you take even more away, then yeah, this stuff should still be bigger than that. So that's what I'm gonna write down. And that is me doing that right here. I'm taking away more, that's why this is still true. And then it went a little bit fast, but now I wanna look on, uh, on this side here. Okay, I'm taking away this Riemann sum of f on q dot, but uh, what if I took this away instead? Well, then you're taking away less. Therefore, this inequality should still be true. So in other words, what I want you to do is on this side, I want you to compare and the bottom line, you're taking away even more. That's why these inequalities should still remain true. And then on the far right side, if you focus on these, uh, on the bottom line, you're taking away less. That's why these inequalities should still remain true. And why is this good? Well, what do you notice about on each side here? Those are just opposites of each other. This is like minus L and this is like L. So I could rewrite this as like an absolute value inequality, which is pretty cool. This is trying to say that the absolute value of the difference between the Riemann sums over these two tag partitions, he should have a dot there, but he didn't, didn't get a dot for some reason. Uh, anyway, the absolute value should be less than uh, this thing. So when I add this stuff up, so I think that you see here, um, in that case, you'd get two epsilon out of that. Now there's one more thing. What did I get to assume that was nice about these functions that I was guaranteed to exist for epsilon? I know that the value of this integral is, maybe I'll scroll back up. What was the hypothesis? Oh yeah, the value of the integral is less than epsilon. All right, so that is pretty key here because then when I replace this by being less than epsilon, then I get that this Riemann sum should be less than, I would have three epsilon now. 
That's pretty cool. Now it's not as pretty as just getting epsilon at the very end, but three epsilon is also very arbitrary. So since epsilon was arbitrary, what would we just show? That the difference between the Riemann sums is arbitrarily small. So that means that uh, we, the, the sum, right, should be adding up to like a, the difference between these sums, right, the, how do I wanna say this? I'll just keep it that way. The difference between the Riemann sums is getting arbitrarily small. So that, what does that show? That shows that F satisfies the Cauchy criteria. And what do we know? We know the Cauchy criteria is equivalent to F being a Riemann integrable function on AB. So that proves this squeeze theorem is maybe an application of how the Cauchy criterion might be, might be useful.